Hey, morning, everybody. Um, so down to the last couple lectures here, um, and we're going to be talking about civil rights. Uh, now, <clears throat> as you guys know, I assume that, um, you know, really the civil rights movement probably began with the anti-slavery movement uh, in this country. Um, so that can date back uh, really early on, uh, in the 17, probably in the 1740s, 50s, somewhere in there. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, anyhow, um, you know, we went through the Civil War, obviously, uh, and then we went through Reconstruction, and uh, things just kind of settled into place um, where people... Um, were segregated, uh, especially in the South. Um, in the North, there was also segregation. Um, it wasn't just uh, in the South. Now, over time, the North became more and more integrated, okay? But the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, as you guys recall, right? Um, the 13th abolished slavery, the 14th, I think you should remember this, uh, that it created equal protection under the law for all Americans for all citizens, uh, and that in and of itself, if we follow the Constitution, then everybody would be treated equally under the law. Um, but we didn't follow the Constitution, okay? Um, the Supreme Court didn't follow the the, the amendment, um, so that was passed in 1866. Uh, the the um, the 14th Amendment, and then 15th to give uh, black men the right to vote or colored men the right to vote. When 1896, this case right here, uh, there was a fight uh, against this, this segregation, and um, the Supreme Court said that uh, uh, separate is equal. Separate can be equal, okay? Um, but in reality, we know this, guys. It wasn't, okay? So this required... Um, what well, didn't require it, it allowed local state governments to set up separate facilities for uh, blacks and colored people and um, and white people and so you had schools uh, that were the same way railroad cars and let me kind of explain this to you guys um, how this worked in, in a lot of communities throughout um, the south um, most towns were built uh, around railroads, okay? We know this in Kansas for sure, but if you go down south, same type of thing, where you have one side of the railroad tracks and you have the other side of the railroad tracks, okay? The white people tend to live and the wealthy on one side of the railroad tracks, and then the color folks tend to live on the uh, other side of the railroad tracks, okay? Now, when you talk about things like schools, schools are funded, yes, by the state, uh, today, um, we we get about, mm, I don't know, 10% of our funding, maybe more now, I have to look into it, but 10% of our funding for, for public schools from the federal government, uh, then you get funding from the state government, and then really one of the major um, mechanisms to fund public schools is property taxes, which is done at the, at the local level. And so if you live in the Goddard School District and they built Eisenhower and Goddard High School in the last, you know, uh, 20 years, both really big, nice schools, um, you've got to have high property taxes. Uh, if you want to turf the softball and the baseball fields and do, you know, have nice facilities, all these computers, a lot of these schools have, every student has a, a computer or an iPad or what have you, um, you've got to raise money. And you do that through raising property taxes. Well, it's hard to raise taxes on the poor. And so if you move into 259, into the city of Wichita, guys, a, a property tax increase is going to affect people disproportionately than it is people in the suburbs. It's just the way it is. Now, back uh, about 10 years ago, um, they did pass a property tax increase. Uh, and uh, it was three, da, 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 370, $380 million that they would raise uh, through property tax increases. Uh, and the major thing they did was improve the sports facilities for our public schools. So 
you look at the new gyms that South has, that East has, Heights has, uh, the new tracks and turf fields and all that, right? So um, that was great. Um, they also built the new Southeast High School with that, okay? Uh, but, guys, that takes a toll on people. So the schools, in reality, um, were not equal, okay? Uh, on one side of the tracks, they didn't have enough textbooks. They didn't have enough teachers. They didn't pay their teachers very much. Um, a lot of schools didn't have air conditioning, things like this. Um, it just didn't have the facilities. And so it's um, definitely on the other side of tracks where the white kids went to school, things were a lot nicer. So this idea of separate but equal is, um, is a fallacy. Now, out of these two fountains, you can see here, um, the water's coming out of the same pipe. So is this equal? I mean, I don't know. Is this one nicer? I guess it could be. Yeah. Okay. Um, these uh, segregation laws are called Jim Crow laws. So that, you know, I think a lot of you guys know this. Uh, Lily, who's a sophomore, uh, she just got done re reading To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and you guys have read, you, you've studied this. Okay. So, so the Supreme Court is saying that segregation doesn't violate the 14th Amendment. Okay, well, what if it wasn't equal? Who are you going to go complain to? You're going to go to the mayor of uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, go to the mayor and say, Mayor, uh, this isn't right. Uh, we're not equal. Um, well, the mayor doesn't have your interest in mind, generally. Okay. Um, now, every community is different. Um, I've talked to some folks that live that grew up in Newton during this time period. I, I'm, I'm talking 1940s, 50s, 60s. Um, Newton's a relatively poor, uh, small town, okay. And you do have diversity. You have uh, you have some African Americans. You have uh, Latino Americans there. Uh, one that I can talk about is Miss Nielsen's mother, um, Connie. Um, half of Miss Nielsen's family is Mexican, okay. And then the other half, I, I believe, is, well, I don't know, Miss Nielsen, um, I, I don't know, I don't know if she's full, you know, uh, Mexican or she's got some white in her. I know she married Ran, uh, who's about as white as you can get. Um, and their their offspring um, is obviously like is mixed half, what have you. Um, but anyhow, Connie um, and other people I've talked to in Newton, they didn't have money to build two schools, so all the kids went to the same school. So there wasn't segregation everywhere. There was kind of segregation based on economics, where you lived, right? Um, but in the South, it was it was much stricter, okay? Uh, we're kind of, you know, we're a little bit north of that Mason-Dixon line, and Kansas has its own uh, history with slavery and anti-slavery in this, in this state. So pretty interesting stuff to talk about, guys. Um, and if you have grandparents, uh, something to talk to them about. Well, you know, what was your school like? Was it was it mixed? Um, and that sort of thing. Okay. So who are you going to complain to if it's not equal? Well, guys, um, remember when we talked about poll taxes? Okay, literacy tests. Um, so you had a situation where even if um, people wanted to elect somebody that would have their best interest in mind. Uh, a lot of time they were prevented from voting, okay? So you're not going to be able to elect somebody that, that really supports you, okay? So government officials wouldn't wouldn't listen. Um, and then there's the whole thing with justice. I mean, like uh, with law and order and, and um, victims of crimes, okay? So you have things like lynchings that we talk about where uh, a lot of times whites in certain areas would get away with harming black people. OK, or black people like we just talked about the kill a mockingbird. Uh, black people would be convicted of crimes that they didn't do. Um, and, and, you know, it's just it, it leads to uh, really live kind of in some areas growing up in fear, uh, t terror. Uh, you know, and a lot of African-Americans have fear of police today. Um, it was it was worse back then. OK, um, so. Guys, this is going to take a while. This is not going to be easy, okay? Uh, and it's really going to take the federal government getting involved, okay? Uh, so let me go to this next slide, and we'll, we'll kind of start working through this a little bit, okay? 
All right, so let me introduce you to Thurgood Marshall. This is him over here, okay? Um, very bright young man. Um, now, there were, um, you know, all-black colleges, so people could go to some of these traditionally all-black colleges uh, and become educated, become lawyers, uh, scientists, doctors, uh, all kinds of things, right? But they were segregated colleges. So... Um, Marshall had become an, uh, an attorney, and um, he brought, uh, he, he helped join this organization called the National Association, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, okay, the NAACP. You guys all, I think you've heard of this, okay. Um, he won a very important case before the Supreme Court. There was this young uh, uh, black man that wanted to go to the University of Texas. He wanted to go to law school. Okay, and um, well, they they said, well, we don't let blacks in our law school. Okay, well, there was no other law school for blacks in Texas. Okay, at least that I'm aware of, and um, so they brought this before the Supreme Court. Well, if there's no place for an African American to study law in Texas, um, it is separate equal. And it's not. And and so the Supreme Court told the state of Texas, said, okay, you got you have three choices here. Okay. You can let this this student in. You can build an entire law school for African American students, or you can shut down your law school. What do you think they did? They let them in. Okay. And so that was a major victory. It's nineteen fifty. Okay. Um now an important thing happened in nineteen fifty three is this man, uh, Earl Warren, was appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, there was a vacancy by President Eisenhower. Now, this is the same Earl Warren, okay, that was the governor of California during World War II when they started rounding up Japanese Americans on the West Coast uh, and putting them in internment camps, okay. Asked many years later, this man, Earl Warren, said that if he had a choice to do it over again with interning Japanese Americans, he would have done it again, okay? And this is something President Roosevelt obviously signed the executive order to do. So, um, you know, that's something that can, can be debated, not really because it's not seen as a debatable issue, uh, but it can be. Um, anyhow, um, so... <sighs> What's interesting is you think, okay, well, this guy's probably pretty conservative because he locked up all the Japanese. Well, as it turns out, Earl Warren will uh, lead one of the most liberal courts in American history, okay? Um, in fact, Eisenhower was kind of upset with him. Eisenhower said, this is probably the worst mistake I made as, my, as president was appointing Earl Warren, okay? And he became chief justice, okay? And so he would be chief justice from 53 to 69. Now think about, I don't know what you know about American history between those those years, but things changed a lot. And a lot of the reasons for that was the Supreme Court. It changes culture, okay? And some of these decisions you may agree with, some you may disagree with. Um, you know, if you don't believe that segregation was wrong, I can't I can't really help you guys, okay? I mean, I, I as I'll talk about this, this is a pretty emotional subject. Um, where you're talking about human beings, okay, and and treating human beings as sub-human beings. And, and to me, that flies in the face of everything that is Christian, uh, about what Jesus teaches us and so forth. Um, now, you had a lot of God-fearing Christians, Southern Baptists, that, you know, thought it was perfectly fine. Um, and they used the Bible to um, say it was okay. Okay, well, I... Okay, I disagree. <laughs> okay, so anyhow, um, so during these years, the Warren, and I took a graduate co uh, class, a whole semester just on this court right here, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll tell you some interesting, an interesting story from that, that I learned in that class. But anyhow, um, segregation, obviously. We're going to talk about Brown versus, but Brown versus Board of Education here in a second. Um, the rights of criminals, okay, so uh, you've all heard of Miranda rights, okay, um, uh, 
if you know if you get arrested they have to read you these okay because you know americans shouldn't be expected to know their rights you know pay attention in, in government class in high school and know your rights right i mean you can't expect that from people so we're going to tell you what your rights are okay you have the right to remain silent that's fifth amendment right no self-incrimination your right to an attorney that's in the fifth amendment as well if you cannot afford one won't be appointed for you uh, and so forth. You understand? Okay, those are your Miranda rights. That comes from a case, 1966, uh, Miranda versus Arizona. Also, things like prison conditions. Uh, prison conditions used to include things like hard labor, where if you went to prison, you know, they could make you work and make you work hard in the hot sun, you know, or in the cold winter. Um, and the Supreme Court started striking down uh, some of these things like chain gangs and and the way they treated prisoners, okay, which really turned them into uh, places where today, I mean, they have libraries, they have video games, they have cable TV, these sorts of things. Um, obviously, they're going to get fed. Um, that would be cruel if not. Um, so some people disagree with some of these decisions and how um, they change the society. Uh, when we talk about le legislative apportionment of the states, uh, there were some, some wrongs that needed to be righted as far as how we set up um, our, our congressional districts. Okay, If you guys remember from government class, our congressional districts have to be um, equal in population or close to equal in population. So you can't just draw, draw one district around Atlanta, Georgia, which has a million or two million people. And that's one district, and then you have some other districts that have 100,000 people in them. That's that's unfair to the people in Atlanta, which disproportionately is African American. Okay, so um, they had to fix some of these things. Okay, um, and and some of them are good, some of them you may not like. Okay. Okay, so we move on to 1954. Okay, Brown versus Board of Education. Okay, now. Um, let me do this. Uh, okay, in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson was an eight to one decision uh, by the Supreme Court. Okay, there was one, and we're gonna learn about this in government uh, coming up today or tomorrow. Um, but you learned about this. There was a dissenting opinion, one dissenting opinion, okay? In 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, it was a 9-0 decision, okay? So <clears throat> this is huge. It's so important that it was unanimous because this is going to change culture, okay? Now, Thoroughgood Marshall, uh, argued that case in front of the court for the NAACP. And the court, by, by making this decision, seemed to say that schools could not be separated by race, and they seemed to be saying that schools had to be integrated, since you can't separate them by race. Um, now, we see this economically today, right? I mean, there's there's more African-American students in the Wichita public schools than there are in the suburbs, okay? Now, if you're an African-American and you move to the suburbs, guess what schools you're going to go to? To the suburb schools, okay? So economically, um, we do still segregate today. So what they did in places like Wichita is they started busing students from one part of town to another to integrate the schools, to mix the races. Okay, so that they would not have, a lot of this, guys, is um, ignorance of other people. Just because you're not around them, you don't have knowledge of people. And generally, we fear, pe fear things we don't understand, okay, or we don't know. And so this, this is something that I have some personal experience with that I'll tell you about probably tomorrow. So um, who was Brown? Brown was the father of three African-American daughters in the Topeka, Kansas school district, okay? And Brown stood up and said, my daughters are not receiving an equal education. They live on the wrong side of the tracks. 
And so the NAACP contacted him, or he contacted the NAACP, rather, and they said, okay, let's bring a case. Now, guys, you understand that somebody like Mr. Brown is really putting his his life at risk in some cases here because he is challenging the status quo. And there's people that don't like that. Okay, so it's, it's a very brave thing to do to attach yourself, your name, your person, your family to an issue like this and, and put yourself out there. Okay, so this, this is a very brave situation. Okay, and so <clears throat> Marshall argues this case and, and wins. I mean, he makes the obvious argument that the 14th Amendment of equal, under, equal protection under the law is not being applied here. Okay. And so here we go, guys. Um, we are going to start busing students into different places, okay? And, you know, as the media does, the media is going to focus kind of on one thing, okay? And uh, so we're going to start with that, and that's where I'll probably finish today, is with Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? We are in the South. Uh, this is, guys, stuff like this is going to happen in all the southern states, Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, okay, North Florida, um, LA, as I call it, right, lower Alabama, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, okay, so th this is the deep south, okay, Arkansas is part of that. And so in Little Rock, the capital, um, Central High School, um, there's an attempt by the, the city council to bring nine black students into this all-white high school. Well, there's a problem. And that problem right here is the governor of Arkansas. The governor, uh, Faubus is his name, okay? And so, now, these students volunteered for this, okay? And so, I mean, I think you could talk to uh, some of our Latino students or Vietnamese students uh, at Bishop Carroll um, and, and and talk to them about what is it like uh, to be a minority in a school of a majority white, you know, white school. Now, I've been teaching in this majority white school um, for 20, 21 years now, and it has become more diverse uh, ever since uh, I've been teaching there. Uh, we have open enrollment. We didn't, when I started teaching, we didn't have that. So our Latino population has grown. Um, our Vietnamese population has grown. Uh, and, you know, a, a few African-American students uh, here and there, okay? Um, and, and part of that's the religion. Part of that's economics. Um, you know, 99% or, or more uh, of our students are Catholic, right? And so that's, that's a major player. Um, so anyhow, uh, when these nine students volunteered for this, guys, and they're going into a situation where the other students do not want them there. The teachers, in many cases, do not want them there. You have to understand this. They're going into a hostile environment, okay? The governor of the state does not want them there, okay? These are brave individuals, okay? And so when the first time they show up, okay, uh, the, the governor calls in the National Guard because he fears violence against these students. That's what he says. He fears violence. And because mobs begin to form, he says, no, we're not going to let the students in because this is going to be a problem. Okay. So the National Guard blocks the black students from entering. And the governor has power over the Arkansas, excuse me, Arkansas National Guard. Um, now, the president can remove them from the governor's use, okay? In fact, it's going to be a federal judge that does that, okay? So you can't do this, okay? You need to apply Brown versus Board of Education here, okay? So they're removed, the National Guard. Next time these students show up, they're met by an angry mob of students and parents, okay? This poor girl gets separated from the other eight, and people are screaming at her. Now, guys, the media is there. The cameras are rolling. And this is going to be shown on the nightly news that night. 
This poor girl sits down on a park bench outside the school, surrounded by angry white people. Now, this woman right here, um, I, I have video that I can't show you. Um, I mean, I can probably pull up. It's from that Century series that I showed you. This woman is interviewed and many years later, and she feels awful for the way she acted on that day, okay? Um, but anyhow, it was a mob, okay? So, guys, once this goes on the new, nightly news, people are outraged what's happening in Little Rock. And so there's a lot of pressure building on President Eisenhower to act, to do something, okay? And so he is going to act, okay? And um, some people think overreact, but Eisenhower doesn't like being criticized. And so he's going to call on call in the 101st Airborne <laughs> to integrate this school, all right? And that's a story I'm going to save for tomorrow. Uh, I'm also going to tell you kind of about my experience of growing up in a very white school and moving to a very diverse school in North Florida. Okay, so I'll tell, talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to cut it off here, and uh, you guys have a good day.